as a uh, as a department head in a large addiction service system, which you would now would probably call an addiction empire. I'm not going to talk about that, but that's how it's how it was in the 80s, and that's when a lot of the addiction services were developing. Then, at one point, I was uh, I became an advanced member of the American College of Addiction Treat Administrators. I've been uh, working in policy and addiction policy in Iowa and in Wisconsin here for a good part of this. I'm currently serving on the scale of the Governor's State Council on the Intervention and Treatment Committee. Uh, I'm also uh, the, serving on the Advisory Council of Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Voices for Recovery, which is opening up the path to recovery. Uh, in different in this conference is special, has given a lot of information on the different ways of doing this. And, and so finally, I'm the managing consultant for the Wisconsin Nicotine Treatment Integration Project known as WinTip. Now here we are at the tail end of this of this conference. We're the last program. Uh, we're going to be participating in the state conference in October as well. Guess where we are on that program? We're the last program on the schedule. Well, what does that mean? Well, maybe it means that the issue is not really that important. It's kind of like an afterthought. Maybe we've got time at the end of these conferences, we can refer to it in some way. Well, I'm here to say that the time has come. The opportunity is here for the very first time to start thinking about bringing tobacco use disorder treatment into the fold, into the standards of practice that we've developed over the years uh, for, nicot uh, for tobacco, for, for at least for substance use treatment we've, we've been calling addiction for many years. And as I was driving here, I was thinking, well, listen, we finally are going to promote tobacco as now finally qualifying for a place in addiction treatment services. They finally seem to be making the grade. So let's promote them and include them in what we've been doing for the last 40 years in treating addiction. Well, let's take a look at that. We're promoting it. Well, what is it? Is, what is tobacco use disorder? Is it, has something happened to it in the last two or three years when you're doing this, putting this new rule together? Is that what's going on here? We finally recognize something we've missed for all these 40 years? The reality is a tobacco use disorder, and what it is, is the same as it's been, as it's always been, a major addiction, a major substance use disorder, and it has never made its way into addiction treatment standards practice. And part of what I hope to share today uh, will be of some value to our virtual audience. Who hopefully, if anything comes, if we do a good job with this program this afternoon, this will be on our C3 Help Us Quit website. So people who didn't make it here today will be able to have some uh, sense of what we've been doing here. So if, having said that, what I guess I want to make before I start into my slides is, Tobacco use disorder, you know, what is it? Well, who's been treating it? If we haven't been treating tobacco use disorders, who has been treating it? Has anybody been treating it? Well, it turns out there's a tobacco prevention and control program that is providing smoking cessation and other services. And Sarah will give us some background on that a little later on. So I'm just gonna start with all of these slides and see if I can get through and make some points as we go along, but I'm not going to engage in conversation with uh, answer questions right now. I want to be able to go through this and give you some background as to what we're doing and talking about here. Is this thing supposed to go forward? It is supposed to go forward. It didn't. Did the battery run out already? No, I think we didn't. I think we the page. Is there a conspiracy? <laughs> okay. We all set? Try now. You're hitting the back button. It's full. What's that? You're hitting the back button. It's full. Oh, hit the back button. No wonder it didn't work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what I would like you to have happen, what I'd like to have happen today is that you'll be able to get a sense of what the implications of this rule you may or may not have read or know much about. Uh, I want to be able to be able to put some historical background. If we're not treating tobacco in, in addiction, why aren't we? What's behind that? 
Okay, take a look at, okay, if we've, if we've got this challenge in front of us as well as the opportunity to do it, uh, what needs to happen here so we become so ethically and cl clinically committed to do it that we feel as we have more comfort in actually starting to do this in our addiction treatment. And also with the Sarah here, letting you know that there's some tremendous resources available as we learn how to do this. Okay, know the rules. Okay, beyond this new rule, DHS 75. And what is, well, this rule is, as I already mentioned, it's the rule that governs addiction treatment in the state. Okay, what does this rule actually do? Well, simply stated, this is basically the rule that governs everything that happens uh, under the control of the state of Wisconsin. This has to do with treating addiction. Addiction. How can I get stumped on the word addiction after all these years? Okay, first thing is to be aware that if we're saying that tobacco use is a disorder that belongs in there, who says so? Well, DSM-5, which is the new one, has made it very clear that it's included. And ASAM, the American Society of Addictive Medicine, says the same. We'll look at that a little bit later. Okay, how does this, the, the definition here, in the current rule as we've been pr practicing it for the last, whenever this rule was first put together, probably 25 years or so ago, it says that in, in the rule that if somebody was in an addiction program in Wisconsin, it was possible for the treatment providers to address nicotine while that could, was going on. Guess who did it? Hardly anybody did it. They didn't touch that and put that in there as something as part of their standards of practice. For the most part, there may be exceptions, but for the most part, the treatment programs in the state did not do anything with that. Uh, second part of that rule, as I recall, is okay, excluding nicotine dependence. That's in the definition in the first rule. was okay that you can treat alcohol, opiates, uh, cannabis, and the rest, but if you're providing addiction services, we're excluding nicotine dependence, as it was called then. So that's what that rule was saying, that even if somebody wanted to do it, the rule says, well, if it's a tobacco use disorder exclusively as their primary addiction, uh, that they were not eligible for access to our treatment programs. One rule out, one rule in. So this is a big chance for some changes, and that's the point I'm hoping to make, is that this is a tremendous opportunity that's been denied. Okay, the new rule, what does it say? It says where it said excluding nicotine, it's now saying it includes nicotine. I'm going to stand over and read this a little easier. So the term is, what's the substance? Well, nicotine, tobacco is a substance. And uh, what's the substance use? Okay, that means that mood altering certs and this fits right in there, according to this, as the other addictions do. The, the, next, the, the new rule the new rule is saying that, okay, uh, that means a diagnosis of substance use disorder listed in the DSM. That means if it's in there, it's eligible then for treatment, even though we haven't been providing it yet. Okay, and the second rule, substance use treatment means if you're providing treatment for, for any substance use, your tobacco use disorder then fits in in that thing. So these two definitions now are taking away what the, the past arrangement and putting a new one in there that puts the opportunity, I keep on referring to the word opportunity, improvement. And here's another part of this rule, and we can thank our, our colleague Bruce Christensen, who for the Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention, and our colleagues there for getting this in the new rule. And this means now that there's a requirement. It's in a way mandated. If you're delivering tobacco, uh, substance use service treatment in Wisconsin after this rule is implemented, there's a requirement and quality assurance will be going around to check and see if compliance with this is going is happening. And there'll be some consequences, of course, if it isn't. And so this is where the main improvements of, of the rule is that, and, and the new DSM-75. Uh, Understanding the issue, this exclusion rule, just to kind of elaborate a little bit more on that. If in the past that has been denied and excluded, is this a discrimination issue, folks? Is it, is it, are people getting due care who have tobacco use disorders, formerly, formerly known as nicotine dependence? Is it due care that they are not 
provided the same scope and standards of practice as we use for alcohol, opiates, and our other uses. Take a look at that. Could that be considered female practice in some people's minds? If we could, if we were able to do it, we're not doing it and haven't been doing it. Is there an issue there on the ethical side of it? I think there is. Part of that rationale we started WinTip was based on what currently smoking and, and tobacco use in the adult population in Wisconsin now is hovering around somewhere around 15%. But as one of the presenters today was talking about uh, earlier, that the uh, what is the prevalence of smoking and using tobacco when people have been it for treatment? If the general public's at 15%, what's What's the score on people who are coming into the treatment programs that we have? And it's hovered between 80 and 90 percent. When I did the, the study at the St. Clair Center in Baraboo, it turned out that 52 patients are inpatient and day treatment patients. The prevalence was 85 percent in a program we had. And that was typical. New York State found a prevalence in opiate users of 92 percent. So that means that we have a vulnerability factor that people who have addicts, other addictions are smoking at this rate, and if the data shows that that's the case, then it's important. And the other people in, in behavioral health and our mental health side of it, you have the same high levels of prevalence of smoking, far above the uh, rate in the general population, which means we are a vulnerable disparity population uh, that has not had the same level of services that we would hope for them. In Wisconsin here, when we did this mortality, there's an update on this, but basically this is pretty accurate. And it shows that, that there's around a thousand, if you put the new overdoses, probably the death rate for drug-related deaths, including overdoses, probably pretty well close to the alcohol, which is around, hovers around 1,500 alcohol-related deaths a year. And then you take the data that we have and have had consistently, is somewhere over 7,000 people die from tobacco-related diseases, and 40-some-odd percent, we estimate, was 3,000 people. In other words, double the people who are dying from opiate overdoses and, and alcohol. Okay, well, what does that really mean? Well, it means if you take a look at it, who, what's the life worth? Is a person who dies from an opiate overdose more valuable to their family and the community than somebody who dies from tobacco? Probably have a hard time defending that. Get back one more to this. I'm just going to quickly touch on this because one of the earlier presenters, by the way, I want to congratulate all of the presenters that I've, I've been to six, well, this will be my sixth session I've attended at this, this year's uh, uh, SUD conference, and the presenters have been marvelous. I'm so grateful that they are. We should be having this particular kind of two day conference in every region of the state annually and have it available so more people that came here will have access to all this good stuff. But this basically shows on the right here, that figure of annual deaths in America now is around close to half a million. And that includes now the people who, who, who perished from the effects of secondhand smoke, plus the, plus the people who are dying from all the lung cancer, heart disease, and the rest. And you start comparing that to the other kind of deaths and you see that if we're going to look at priorities of what's important, and we've got this level of death from the people that, that we serve, uh, that's pretty important information. So to help us motivate, okay, we, we our call to action is based a lot on the fact that people are dying and we can do something about it. And I just, just pass over this, but just to reinforce uh, this, this particular uh, picture or graph, this shows that the arrow in the bottom is, is a state rate of 15%. But these are all uh, uh, bipolar disease, uh, schizophrenia, PTSD, anxiety, and depression. Look at their high rates of prevalence in that. And some go, well, what's the big deal about that? Hey, well, part of the big deal is the World, Health, the World Health Organization tells us that if a person smokes cigarettes for 20 years or in the middle of life, almost half of those people, not may die, will die from, from tobacco caused and related diseases. We'll talk a bit about it. There'll be something, something, something in that little. And here's another one here. This one says, okay, 44% of the people who uh, have mortality than the people who've got alcohol, drug, and, and behavioral health diseases. But on the other, there are people who don't have those, right? Well, wait a minute. 
Stop here. There's a person who gets a DSM diagnosis for tobacco use disorder, have a substance use disorder? Yes. So even that is the law say, okay, that, that, that people who have a tobacco use disorder, in our experience and the work I've done, is they don't accept that. They don't want to be like addicts and alcoholics. So they don't think that they need to have the same services that an alcoholic or a drug addict may require and need. Okay, well, that's a puzzle. And that's the point, one of the points that I'd like to make and wanted to make here is that I've never done this particular presentation before. So here we have a situation where the United States of America creates a comprehensive addiction treatment system. Creates it, invents it, evolves it, improves it for the better part of 50 years. And yet, leaves out the one addiction that kills more addicts, people with this, than all of the rest. So what the heck is going on that this happens? And by the way, is this, is this a, a point that we can defend and, and look into and to confirm this is actually true? I'm just not spouting off a bunch of ideas that I just happen to hold as opinions. Hey, how, but how did this happen? I'm going to put together a little bit of a historical timeline. I think it might help us see uh, some of the explanation for how I think this happened. I, I turned myself into an investigative reporter when I discovered this, I, this whole issue of tobacco use uh, prevalence when I didn't know anything about it after doing addiction treatment programs for 25 years and missed it all together. And I'm a, I'm a re recovering uh, tobacco addict myself. By the way, in addition to my career in addiction, I'm a consumer. I've been in long-term recovery from my alcohol and tobacco addiction, addiction from my alcohol for 65 years next month. I've been in recovery for a long time. So I have a consumer perspective as a person. So thank you. And so thanks for that. So let's take a look at what we think happened. First of all, smoking was a was pretty normal. When I grew up, it was not seen as a either an addiction or we knew it was a not a good idea from a health perspective, but it was a normal whatever smoking cigarettes in hospitals and everything else was typical and normal. In 1964, the Surgeon General came out with the report that they had confirmed scientifically with data that 90% of people who die from lung cancer are smokers. And this became an alert that, okay, this was confirmed now. All the tobacco companies denying that Nicotine was addictive, uh, was being swept aside for the first time with this Surgeon General's report. Okay, and so therefore there became, we need to do something about that. We've got this report from the Surgeon General. We believe it to be true. It's backed up with data. We know it's the way it is. So what happened was the federal government, the CDC, created the Office of Smoking and Health as a federal agency that whose mission would be to do something about the Surgeon General's report that too many people are sick and dying from smoking and having tobacco, so they, they did that. So what they did, one of the things they, they did, and I'll, I won't go into too much detail, because Sarah will be able to give you better information I have on this, that they set up quit lines. Eventually now it became nationally, every state in the country has got as a basic uh, way of helping people quit smoking, we call it smoking cessation, was going to be in every state as a single state agency. And they discovered the disparities I've already referred to with some of my charts here, that people with addiction, alcohol, people with very ethnic backgrounds, low economic, and right across uh, the, all the disparities of these people and these groups that they identified uh, were people with more trouble and were having uh, more trouble with tobacco than the general public. And so in Wisconsin, they created the Wisconsin, when well, all the states, most of them are called the tobacco prevention and control programs that became a single state agency funded by CC, CDC and others. And that has now been active in this state for a long time. And they fund our WinTEP program primarily, although the Bureau of uh, Prevention, Treatment and Recovery also provides some supplementary funding. But basically everything we're doing at WinTEP is happening because the tobacco program identified there's a disparity population of alcoholics and drug addicts in people with psychiatric and mental health disorders that were in real big trouble based on the data that I showed you of the prevalence of it. So, okay, we wanted to fund programs that are going to address these disparity populations. And here they are, African-Hispanic, 
American Indians, Native Americans, Alaskans, Asians, Pacific Island, and all these people are smoking at higher rates. Lesbian, gay, we talked to today, we had a good presentation on, on, on those issues, low so, and education, and adults with mental health and substance abuse, and tobacco use by geographic reasons. The data shows that parts of the country are smoking heavier than others. It's, incidentally, most of them are tobacco producing states. So then was, we look at alcohol as, as a, a comparison, is drinking a social norm in Wisconsin? Well, it's not only a social norm, it's a, it's a very big deal in Wisconsin, it's just in other parts of the country. And so that remains then a social reality that alcohol is part of life in, in Wisconsin. But like in a tobacco thing, it became as people looking into this, there was a downside from all of this alcohol consumption, legal, health, financial, family, and those were identified. And those of you who do assessments for people coming into treatment, one of the things we've always done with that is identify all the other issues related to the drinking and drugging as part of major issues for treatment planning. So alcohol, okay, services emerge on the public health scene now, alcohol joining tobacco, really? But going back then to, this, to some of the history that I've been able to figure out and learn, is in 1935, a couple of people got together and started, got this idea about Alcoholics Anonymous, and they published a book in 1939, so speaking around 1940, that they were finding, some, experimenting some ways of one alcoholic helping another in groups to see if that would be have any impact on all these alcohol-related problems that were identified. Okay, then, and after some of that success had been documented, uh, the American Medical Association, with Dr. Jelnick's book, The Disease Concept of Alcoholism, AMA decided this is a medical issue we need to address. And so they recognized alcoholism as a disease. Uh, but it took 30 years before the same body recognized addiction in a broader sense. And they recognized uh, the all drug addiction as medical disorders. Then the federal government, like they, they created uh, the Office of Smoking and Health, created NIAAA, the National Institutes of Alcohol and Alcoholism. Okay, and that was to be able to address these concerns around alcohol problems. And the mission there was to basically was to, what do we need to find out about what alcohol is doing in our community to the Indian to people? And let's look into that. And as we apply what we learn, to the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of alcohol-related problems. My first job as a counselor was the Alcohol-Related Problem Service Center in Decorah, Iowa. Okay, so that mission was to apply what they were learning into these programs. But it was alcohol only. Before those of you who are used to having the co-occurring -treat co treatment of addictions all in the same programs, that was not the case at the beginning. No, it wasn't. The single issue kind of thing of alcohol was over here, but the other drugs were left out at that time. They created this agency to focus on alcohol. But then in the 60s, the, 60s, the so-called drug scene emerged stronger. Now, when I got into recovery in 1956, I didn't know anybody who knew who was smoking marijuana or doing other drugs at the time. It was not common like it is now. Those of you who are younger, they wonder, how could it be that there was no marijuana pot was around in high schools? Well, I can report to you that was the case in the, at that time. But the drug scene and all of its problems started to emerge. And so the federal government created NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse for, uh, Program for Drugs Other Than Alcohol. So now we've got two federal agencies and with programs that were directed to the states to, to, make the, to work on these issues in, at the state level. What was their mission? Okay. In 1974, they, they formed this NIDA. It was 1974. It was this, coincidentally, it was the year that I started my career as an, as an addiction specialist. So what were they doing? Okay. The research, treatment, prevention, training, data collection. They had a broad mission. Oh, guess what? Guess who got left out? of all these drug uh, addictions that were under the, uh, the, the control or the direction of, the, of NIDA. Tobacco was left out here again. 
Now, it was all the way up to uh, recently, uh, 16 to 20, the United Strategic Plan started to include nicotine in what it was doing. It wasn't there at the beginning in 1974, but by 1920, a year ago, uh, they, it is. So they wanted to then to, but now we're into the brain disease issues around addiction. And so they wanted to dedicate a lot of uh, research into that brain issues and, and do that. And so they wanted to be able to do something with what they were learning. So the educational part of it and it became part of that mission and improve the uh, awareness that addiction is a brain disease. Well, a lot of people didn't have any sense of it. Addiction was a brain disease, it was a bad habit, it was people, weak-willed people who, were, who weren't smart enough not to do it and get in trouble with it. So this was another, as we're looking at a timeline, some of the improvements. Now here are the federal agencies and programs that you may or may not know about, you know, most of you here probably do, and here's SAMHSA in there, SAMHSA uh, was created in 1992, pretty recent. You think it's been around for a long time, it hasn't been around that long. And even this one here, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, that was the federal, the president's offices uh, for the drug war. So Samson in, in, uh, in 1992, well, what did they do? They said, okay, in this idea of disparity populations, we've got these, uh, these addictions, substance use disorders, we've got mental health and psychiatry, we need to put them together. They're doing that in, in, in the field. They're now treating alcohol and drugs together. That started with the notion of chemical dependency in Minnesota, using the Minnesota model. Right, that meant that now they're doing it. Why did they do that? Because when they stopped to treat these separately and put people in hospitals and programs, it was going to be a tremendous expense beyond what people are willing to pay. When they figured out, why can't we do this at the same time in the same programs? And that's what we've been doing. So this is this umbrella of them, the two of them, it's a merger then, and understanding that, and that is, you've got, you got traditional medicine, you've got the other parts of the CDC's health programs, and we have this new emerging concept of behavioral health. And by the way, that's what they're doing at the state level in Wisconsin, they merge them both into the Division of Care and Treatment, and the Bureau of Prevention, Treatment, and Recovery. Okay, now again, I'm not going to go on this, but we've already established it, already said established it, okay, as people with great credibility are saying that, that it does belong, this is a substance use disorder, and belongs in our treatment programs. The SM5, and it just describes basically that, uh, what all the, they describe it basically with the same language as they describe the other ones. A diagnosis based on evidence of impaired control, social impairment, risk to use, and pharmacological criteria. Recurrent use of tobacco causes clinically and functionally significant impairments such as health problems, disability, and failure to meet major responsibilities at work, school, and home. So there we have the same kind of a definition of what a substance use disorder is, and it's under the, the label here of tobacco use disorder. Okay, CDC says it's chronic. So our individual acute uh, short-term treatment programs are inadequate according to these ideas. This is a chronic disease. It's gonna require perhaps lifetime ongoing recovery support of, of different kinds. And so this repeated treatment success, but the thing is that they've established that it can be treated and successful recoveries are possible and happen. So I like this little one here, which uh, it is part of the theme of, of what I'm working on, which is we've identified what the addiction treat model and the treatment model is, and I'm going to give a little bit of that in my second part of my presentation. Uh, the tobacco control model, but essentially, although we do have harm reduction issues around this, the basic uh, uh, goal of both of these systems is abstinence, to have people uh, in recovery from the substance that's causing the the difficulty in their lives and the health and other problems go with it. So Wisconsin uh, tobacco control model, uh, I've already mentioned that is it in Wisconsin, it's, uh, it's in the Division of Public Health, I won't talk about that much anymore. And it's got understanding a bit of it, it's a quit line in the program that, that Sarah works for. Uh, there they manage the quit line and most of the, the things around smoking cessation. 
understanding the evidence-based tobacco control model. Uh, there's some details on here. You'll be able to get this PowerPoint, so you can be able to look at that a little bit more. But there are evidence-based elements to this, uh, and you can look at them when, when you can want to later. Uh, addiction model, on the other hand, uh, is, is a program that's ended up in the Bureau of Prevention Treatment in the Division of Care and uh, Treatment in the, in the Department of Health Services. And variations of this, we've got some folks from our corrections colleagues who are here with us this afternoon. And this issue is a very much an issue in another department, not the Department of Health Services, but the Department of Corrections, where it's an ongoing element in getting people ready for uh, return to the community, to community-based corrections. There are issues around tobacco and addiction that you're dealing with all the time. And the other department is the Department of Safety and Professional Services, which create, which license and certify people so they'll have the scope of practice they can actually do this work uh, and be reimbursed for it. I won't go into the details of the addiction treatment model. I'll be referring to it a bit a little later. And so let the debate begin. Uh, should we do this or shouldn't we do this? And who says so? That's the question. Well, convince me you must. You know, it's going to be a debate and then figure out should we do it or shouldn't we do it? We haven't do, been doing it, so should we do it now? Is tobacco free realistic? Recovery realistic? Well, records in their studies show that yes, smoking rates in individuals in our populations, the research shows they want to quit tobacco, are able to quit, and this is important to people as you try and get this uh, included in our services. Quitting does not threaten their recovery process, which was an excuse in the past, was okay, if we ask people to quit smoking when they're in this program, uh, they'll fail at that. This will corrupt what we're trying to do with the other issues we're treating them for. Well, whose job is this? Now, the fact is that most of the slides that I'm presenting probably deserve a 15 minute or a half hour group conversation about what what we think about it and what we, how we understand it. I got, don't have time to do that, but who's responsible for doing this is an important issue. Apparently, an addiction folks like me for 25 years didn't think it was my job. Nobody demanded I do it. There was no demand for it. People were not at the door of the St. Clair Center demanding to come in there to quit smoking. So it wasn't an issue apparently to do much about at that time. Ethical issue. Basically, what I said at the beginning of my comments is that due care, people deserve due care for the conditions that they bring to us for help. They deserve it. If it's possible to do it, they deserve to have access to it. The reality is that tobacco program, control programs have nowhere near, nowhere near the comprehensive resources and levels of care that we have, that we have in our standard of care. They don't have that. We do. So they deserve it. And here's the here's one that I want to really enforce as a positive element. We because we can do this. You know, when I eventually did get around and had a chance to put a tobacco program into at the St. Clair Center, I found out I had all the skills I needed at, the, at my training that I could readily just include this in it in what I was already doing. I didn't know that. I didn't realize that that was true until I actually started doing some of it. We did a study uh, at a conference like this. The first one was in Appleton years ago, and then the other one was in Madison. We had 200 clinicians, and we had our founding director, Dr. Eric Halligenstein, did an educational program on this. And we did a, st a study and a survey of, every, of 200 some odd who went there. And we put a survey that, as part of the experience that we able to fill this out. And after people were exposed to what we're talking about here today, 92%, they now believe ethically and clinically they ought not to be treating tobacco use disorders concurrently with what, everything else they were treating. So this was an important buy-in piece to the campaign that Wintip has been making. Is there any chance if we tell people and help them to understand this issue better, that our clinicians and managers uh, would buy into it and, and, and agree that, that they can and ought to and need to do it. I'm against this. Well, 
The first training that I did, my colleague Robert Ingram and I did a no more, a no more nicotine campaign in St. Clair Hospital when they were required and wanted to go. This They did this voluntarily before the, the law came in, that there was no smoking in the St. Clair Hospital. And they knew that a lot of their employees were smokers. So what should be done about this? So we created this program, No More Nicotine, and we had uh, had people from the area, the Baraboo area, come in because for this innovative six months, no more nicotine uh, program that we created and that had not yet tried out. So 15 came to the first one, and we presented an, an addiction model for quitting smoking. Well, after that session was over, and we had a meeting that everybody talked about this, and every one of them did not identify anywhere close to being an addict, a drug addict, or an alcoholic, even though probably half of them were, and said they didn't like that. They didn't want to have this approach to addiction programs, and they didn't come back. So we had started the Nicotine Anonymous group as part of this global War Nicotine thing, and I've been doing Nicotine Anonymous groups for 18 years. I think it's 18 years. Okay, but they're not like us. We're different. We smoke these legal products. We can get them everywhere. We know they're not good for us, uh, but we can do it. It's free will and whatever else it is. And I absolutely do not want to go to an addiction treatment program to quit smoking. That was the initial reaction to when we were starting to do that. They're not like us. Well, it turns out that uh, part of the myth was that, that people with mental illness and substance use can't quit smoking anyway. They try all the time, but they can't quit. And then uh, mental illness and substance use don't want to quit. There's no motivation. That turns out to be a myth and not true. Quitting smoking is a low priority problem and medical providers have more important things to worry about than smoking. And smoking calms down consumers without smoking. Facilities will be complete mayhem. While our colleagues in the, in the corrections folks here will say, wait a minute, isn't it more true that if the law came in, people in jails and prisons we're not going to be able to smoke in those places anymore. Is that true? Oh, yes, it was true. Guess what happened? Where were the riots? There were no riots. They adapted to that standard that of, of what was happening there. No tobacco was products were banned. There was, of course, there was smuggling and contraband and everything else that goes on. But nevertheless, the point was. That they, 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 they so disruptive. It was like when we went to uh, tobacco smoke free in Wisconsin. That the the the, 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 the liquor industry, the the, uh, the 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 lobby. I can't remember the name of it now. I should know it. Uh, said this is going to ruin uh, business, small business in Wisconsin. Uh, bars and taverns will go broke. Uh, that'll be the end of our business. You're being forcing us into a uh, into a a rule uh, that's going to ruin our business. So what happened? The rule came in. Did the bars go broke? No. What they found out was that people appreciated going in for a few beers with a place that wasn't filled with smoke. So that particular myth turned out to be what a myth. Okay. Uh, few opportunities where the staff can smoke with the patients. Well, I was a part of that. In the program I was in, in Baraboo, the clinical director, the director of the program, the other two counselors, aside me, I was the only tobacco-free person on staff. The rest of them were all smokers, all of them. Turned out that 36% of people who were in the addiction field as counselors and, and working in, the, in, those, in those programs were tobacco uh, smokers. They were nicotine, nic nicotine dependent themselves. Okay, necessary medication. They need to smoke to manage their mental illness, threaten recovery, no time. These myths were barriers to be able to do this transition into tobacco use. Now, we've addressed them all in WinTip, and we know that they are myths and not accurate. The Emerging Concepts of American Society of Addiction Medicines is worth a minute. Is that this means that nicotine addiction is a primary medical problem deserving of thoughtful ongoing attention from every responsible person. Clinician. This is a doctor's group. And diseases either caused by or made worse by tobacco use, get ready, should be regarded as complications of nicotine addiction. Switch the horse. 
in front of the cart so that these people are getting sick and dying from lung cancer and heart disease and emphysema because of their addiction to nicotine that's causing these diseases that are killing them. New fresh ideas. A lot of us have not seen that before. Benefits for patients, I'll just go quickly through this, reduces the threat of death by tobacco, improves every other element of the treat, treatment plan, uh, plans, what they're trying to do. It reduces the family concerns of people who got smokers in the family or getting sick from it. Risks of relapse is reduced when they're able to do this. Improves confidence and self-esteem. If I can quit smoking after all the time, I tried this. Maybe I can do other things. And for providers, it's seeing reducing the death risk for our patients. If we're able to get them into tobacco-free recovery, the data shows their chances of surviving, getting that extra 10 or 12 or 15 years, uh, will be able to benefit they get from it. And at some point, somebody may sue the, the treatment uh, programs or, or industry for not doing this because it's not, not providing due care and somebody should maybe have to hold them accountable. And it promotes a sense the client self-efficacy. If somebody that you're working with a multitude of different concurrent ideas is able to get tobacco free, I mean, they're right, probably going to be able to make a lot of progress on the rest of it. Relapse risks and that's that risk will be reduced. Conferred behavior therapists can successfully address this. They're okay. They've never done it, has to do it before, but can they do it? Well, we'll show that they can. Okay. Uh, just a couple of points here, and I think I'll get there. I'm getting to a place now. I think maybe I might be getting ready to switch uh, here for uh, a few minutes more. Is it what are wind, what's Wintu doing about this? Well, we've been working on it for since 2008, since we were created, and some of us were doing it for five years before that. Okay, we're taking shape on an implementation plan that everything we've learned for these 15 years will be available to treatment providers, counselors, and the rest to be able to learn from what we've been doing, getting ready for this eventful opportunity that's right in front of us. Working on a resolution right now to establish the, that this tobacco integration become a priority under this new rule in the year that it's being uh, uh, transitioned. And that the education and training that we've been working will be available. And there's more to be said on that. Okay. Okay, the path. Quick, just one sentence here. We've been operating on the buy-in plus training plus resources equals implementation and don't do implementation until adequate progress has been made on those three elements in it. That's what we're fo focusing on there. And we've got early adopters, the people that have done what we've been advocating for. There's a marvelous woman uh, named Sheila Weichs. Uh, by the way, a lot of the, the lead champions that I've been working with are females. Got some marvelous women who've been advocating and championing this, this issue. And she's, she's definitely the godmother of the whole thing. And so they, they, they put a 100% program, uh, complete uh, alcohol, drug, and tobacco-free environment for patients who are treated. And that they, they integrated the education and the, the group activity and everything so all the drugs and alcohol were all treated together. For 10 years, they had that operating there and did not lose business, and I've got the documentation to, to prove that. New York State is the only place in the world, I mentioned that in an earlier session, it's the only place in the world so far that I can find out that's done this across the entire state's addiction treatment services, all have to be alcohol, drug, and tobacco-free, and was completely integrated programs. When they introduced their 80, 856 rule in 19, uh, 2008. They did the first uh, quality assurance on it. They had 70% compliance. Who would have thunk it? The treatment programs accepted enough to comply with it. And in the second year, they got that up to 90% compliance, which meant then that as we move forward, we've got some evidence that when you do this, it does not destroy the addiction treatment system. That's pretty good. And many of the other programs, and that's another piece of that. So we do invite you folks to be able to, to join us uh, in this and become advocates in your own programs uh, in whatever way you can. Uh, I put this, I, I was the one who, did, who came up with this brand of WinTip. And that WinTip is based on win, which is success, find a way to succeed, and tip, how to do it, WinTip. 
So I came up on this presentation here, that if you got on board with us and you join us, you will be wind tippers. What a terrific idea. I've never been able to make any money out of anything I ever did, and that's probably not going to be the case here either. Okay, here's a contact information for you. I'm going to skip through all of these resources that we have uh, because uh, there you are. I'm going to turn this back to, over now to my colleague, gratefully. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. All right, so thank you, Mac. Uh, I'm Sarah Thompson. I'm the Regional Outreach Specialist with the Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health. Always have to take a breath there, big long title. Uh, so during my part today, we're just going to expand on what Mac already talked about, but take a deeper look at understanding tobacco use as an addiction and a chronic relapsing condition. We'll understand the evidence-based practices um, that work for tobacco treatment, treating tobacco use disorder, what's available, and then how can we tailor them for a client's need and their readiness for change. As part of that, we'll describe some additional resources that can support tobacco use disorder treatment, such as the Wisconsin Tobacco Quitline and the Bucket Approach Training. So starting with the basics, uh, develop it, the development of nicotine dependence. Uh, when someone inhales a combustible cigarette, it only takes about seven seconds for that nicotine to reach the brain. So that's incredibly efficient. Incredibly efficient is one of the uh, most efficient substances, faster than if it were to be injected into a vein. Uh, so it reaches the brain very rapidly. Uh, it's been a highly engineered product to be able to do this. Again, nicotine is the substance within combustible cigarettes and other tobacco products that is mediating the addiction. When it's inhaled, um, travels through the bloodstream to the brain where it stimulates um, acetylcholine nicotinic receptors, which then stimulates the release of dopamine. I'm sure you're all very familiar. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that's involved in the reward pathway and the pleasure sensation that gives people a feeling of um, calmness, pleasure, and, and rewards, of course. Over time, those dopamine levels will start to reduce as the nicotine is metabolized in the body. Um, and this leads to the symptoms of withdrawal, the cravings and the triggers, um, feelings of discomfort and, and anger, irritability. And over time, uh, the brain continues to learn to need that nicotine to have uh, that pleasure sensation in the brain and body. So this is really where we're de developing nicotine dependence. This might sound familiar. This is the typical drug dependence pathway that we see for other, other addictions and other substances. And I what's really happening here is that nicotine is actually changing the structure of the brain. Over time, it learns that it needs that nicotine. The brain develops more and more receptors, and that's where we deepen the dependence and eventually have tobacco use disorder. Uh, tobacco continues to be the number one cause of preventable death and disease in the United States. As Mac mentioned, in the general population, about 14 to 15 percent of individuals uh, use combustible cigarettes. That translates to about 34 million adults who continue to use tobacco products. Um, as a result, it, is, it impacts just about every part of the body. Um, is attributed to over 30 types, 30 percent of cancer diagnoses in the United States. Um, which eventually results in about half a million deaths of Americans annually are directly attributed to tobacco use. That's about one in every five deaths in the United States. So really a profound impact in terms of um, the public health of the U.S. If we look at it from the other hand, in terms of cessation, it's never too late to quit smoking. There are always benefits. Uh, they start almost immediately within the first 20, 30 minutes of, of quitting using tobacco. The heart rate and blood pressure will begin, begin to normalize. Um, carbon monoxide levels in the blood and the body will start to return to normal in just a few hours. Within a few weeks, uh, lung function begins to improve uh, clinically, but also many people also report that they, their lungs and their breathing starts to feel better in just a few weeks. Within a year, risk of coronary heart disease is cut in half to that of a, a non-smoker. And in, within 10 years, risk of dying from lung cancer can be cut in half as well. So pretty profound impacts in terms of cessation on physical health. 
Um, and again, never too late to quit smoking. Those impacts start to take place almost immediately. But we know that there are not just benefits to our physical health. There are other uh, really incredible benefits associated with tobacco use disorder uh, cessation and recovery from tobacco use disorder, specifically looking at behavioral health. Um, when we look at recovery, people who experienced co-treatment of nicotine with other substance use disorders was associated with a 25% greater likelihood <laughs> of abstinence from all substances. Um, and if we look at it from the other end, people who continued or started to use nicotine and tobacco products uh, while in recovery from other substances were 25% at a 25% greater likelihood of relapsing. In terms of mental health, uh, smoking cessation is associated with reduced depression, anxiety, stress, uh, reduced or improved positive mood and quality of life. Um, pretty profound impacts and greater than or equal to that of using certain antidepressant medications. So it's, it's not just moderate impacts, but pretty significant impacts in terms of mental health outcomes. Uh, one other benefit is in terms of social networks. Oftentimes people record, report uh, fear of quitting and that they might lose friends or connections. Everyone in their environment uh, uses tobacco as well. Uh, but research actually shows us that one to two years following cessation, social networks have actually been found to increase. Uh, so taking a closer look at tobacco dependence, tobacco use disorder, it really is a two-part addiction like other addictions that we see. There's a physical aspect, so that physiologic nature, um, what's happening in the brain and body, we now understand there is a biologic basis in how we develop, um, continue to develop the, the addiction over time. People use uh, tobacco for both positive and negative reinforcement. They use it to disrupt those negative withdrawal symptoms, those uncomfortable feelings, uh, but other people use tobacco to, to feel good. We have that dopamine boost when we consume tobacco products. The other arm is the psychological arm. And of course, these two arms are, are tightly intertwined. They are interlinked. It's not two separate arms. There is some interaction. But in terms of the psychological component, people continue to use tobacco despite the known consequences to health. Um, those, they're fairly, fairly widely known and most people are aware of the risks. Uh, many people do use tobacco as a coping mechanism, um, oftentimes to try and relieve the stress that's going on in their life and, and negative uh, feelings or anxiety that they might have. And as part of that, people often use tobacco because it's a consistent behavior. It's something that's predictable. They know what's going to happen when they utilize it. Sometimes it can feel like a friend providing a little bit of support and, and always being there for you. Uh, so now that we better understand the addiction and that there really are two parts to the addiction and dependence, um, it makes sense that there should be two parts to the treatment as well. Uh, first, to address that physical and physiologic nature, we can address this through medications for cessation. And then to address the psychological component of it, really that behavior and habit element of using tobacco. Using tobacco in and of itself isn't just a bad habit, but there is a habit, habitual element of when someone uses tobacco and why they might be using it because of the environment around them. This can all be addressed through behavior change programs. So for the best odds of successful long-term recovery, treatment should address both of these elements concurrently. And this may sound familiar because combining medication and counseling, in other words, this is medication assisted treatment. This is what we would recommend for many other addictions, combine some sort of pharmacologic intervention with behavioral therapies. So if we know what works, we have these evidence-based uh, ideas uh, and treatments available. Why aren't more people successful in quitting? Uh, ultimately, um, only about 7% of people who who try to quit, uh, let me back up, 70% of people who use tobacco are actually interested in quitting. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they're ready to quit at any given time, uh, but they are interested in quitting long term. And more than 50% of the, them actually do make a quit attempt each year. So why aren't they successful then? Uh, only about one third of them, slightly less than one third, utilize some form of support, whether it's counseling, medication, or both combined. 
Um, so there's very limited access to the treatments that we know are effective at helping people quit. On top of that, um, so individuals who don't utilize any of these resources, only 7% if they attempt to quit cold turkey are likely to be successful. How can we further make sure that individuals have access to these treatments? Uh, five A's provide a framework to incorporate into a clinical setting. Uh, when clients or patients are walked through all five A's, they are eight times more likely to utilize one of our evidence-based treatments and therapies. So really important in making sure uh, that we get the, in helping get these treatments into the hands of patients and clients who might need them. So to start the five A's, just start with an ask. Do you currently use tobacco? Uh, what tobacco products do you use? How frequently do you use them? Then provide some clear, strong, tailored advice. The most important thing you can do for your health, both physically and mentally, is to quit. Then we're going to assess their willingness to make a quit attempt. What are your thoughts on quitting tobacco in the next 30 days? I have resources that can help you. Then based off that assessment, again, not everyone is going to be ready to make a quit attempt right now, but that doesn't mean that we can't provide some sort of support and resources and assistance. It's really important that we provide assistance for anyone who's interested based off of their motivational readiness and their goals. Um, so provide appropriate assistance who, for people who are ready to make a quit attempt, and then we can provide some motivational interventions for people who are not quite ready to make that quit attempt right now. And then the fifth A is to arrange follow-up. Again, we know it's a chronic relapsing condition that requires ongoing, at times lifelong support um, to maintain that long-term recovery and abstinence. So really important to arrange follow-up. Uh, taking a closer look at those evidence-based treatments, uh, starting with our smoking cessation medications, there are seven approved by the FDA that can reliably increase long-term abstinence rates. Uh, two non-nicotine options that are prescription only in bupropion and varenicline. And then there are five nicotine replacement therapy or NRT options um, in the form of patch, lozenge, gum, nasal spray, and inhaler. Again, all seven of these have been shown when used alone can reliably increase long-term abstinence rates and they all serve they all uh, function a little bit differently have different mechanisms of action but serve to reduce and minimize the withdrawal symptoms that individuals may experience uh, so then they can shift the focus onto the behavior behavior change elements and don't have to continuously focus on the irritability and the negative things that their body might be going through Digging deeper into each of these medications, uh, bupropion is an atypical antidepressant. It's also known as Zyban or Wellbutrin. And the uh, presumed mechanism of action is that it blocks the neural reuptake of dopamine and or norepinephrine. The other non-nicotine option is varenicline, which is also known as Chantix. And it is, it binds at the nicotinic receptor sites and actually has a dual function in that it has both agonistic and antagonistic properties. So when it binds to those nicotinic receptors, it's going to release the dopamine, but at a much lower level to help minimize those withdrawal symptoms. At the same time, as it's binding to those receptors, it's going to prevent any nicotine from giving an additional boost, an additional positive uh, reinforcement, uh, as it's, it's doesn't allow the nicotine to bind there. So if anyone does happen to use tobacco while on varenicline, they're not going to get some additional, um, the additional positive reaction from it. Uh, regarding these two medications, there was some concern at one point that they caused some serious neuropsychiatric events in uh, patients who use them. Uh, so there was a large clinical trial, more than 8,000 people. It was called the EAGLE study. As a result of that study, it was concluded, uh, the FDA concluded that the risk of serious neuropsychiatric events was much lower than previously thought, and uh, the warning label was removed as a result of the study. So we know that these medications are safe and effective in the general population, as well as in individuals who live with a behavioral health condition. Switching over to our nicotine replacement therapy options, again, there are five NRT options. The patch, which is a long-acting form, a great option for individuals who just want to put it on a clean area of skin in the morning and leave it on all day and not have to 
to think about when do I need to take my medication or uh, be picking up my next piece of gum. The other four options are all long acting forms, so our inhaler, nasal spray, lozenge, and gum. I'm not going to get too deep into the details of those, but all of them should be taken at um, shouldn't be taken ad lib when someone is experiencing cravings, but instead should be taken on a, a prescribed dosing, starting perhaps at every hour interval or two hour intervals, depending on the individual's level of dependence. So what are some reasons for using NRT? Um, generally, they're very easy to use, generally very acceptable interventions. It's not another medication to take. Uh, fairly limited side effects compared to other medications, minimal drug-to-drug -drug interactions, and again, extremely safe. They provide a safe study level of nicotine. Uh, and sometimes people say, well, if nicotine is the active ingredient in tobacco products and combustible cigarettes, why are we going to treat that with nicotine? Ultimately, the reason we do that is that it's a much lower dose. It's going to be a safe study level that's been highly studied um, at a prescribed dosage. So we know the exact amount that someone's getting, and it's going to help at the prescribed dose, help them to learn, help the brain unlearn. Uh, that it no longer needs nicotine to be happy. At the same time, it's also going to help the person by getting clean nicotine. So if someone continues to use combustible cigarettes, they're still consuming those toxins and carcinogens that are present. Whereas in NRT, it's going to be a clean nicotine. Additionally, not another pill. So a great option that doesn't have uh, additional side effects. A lot of options available. What's the most effective option in terms of medication? Uh, Varenicline or Chantix is the single most effective option when used alone. Uh, another great option that can as much as triple likelihood of success when used alone is combination patch plus NRT or gum. So now shifting over to that uh, psychologic element, how can we support people through the behavior change programs? Um, and that's through counseling and coaching. For clients who are motivated to quit, we can provide a brief counseling intervention, help them by setting a quit or recovery date, should be in the next few weeks to capitalize on that motivation and, and readiness for change, but also give a little bit of time to prepare. Um, through that process, then you want to understand their history with tobacco use, understand if they've made quit attempts in the past, what has been uh, successful, where maybe they may have had challenges, and learn from those past quit attempts and build on that. So really help uh, to, to build coping skills that might work for that individual and better understand what are the challenges and temptations that, might, that they may face. Um, and another important element is to prepare a plan for relapse. This is a chronic relapsing condition. Typically, it takes between five and eight quit attempts before someone can successfully uh, maintain long-term recovery or abstinence. Um, so it is likely that individuals will quit uh, medications and counseling can help uh, prevent that and minimize that, but just to be aware, what should an individual do if they do happen to not necessarily have a relapse, but a lapse and use one cigarette or a few cigarettes? Can they continue their progress forward? Uh, another option to continue to extend counseling is the Wisconsin Tobacco Quit Line. The Quit Line provides free, confidential, tailored, phone based. Uh, services and text messaging program. It's available to any Wisconsin resident over the age of 13. Uh, the quit line is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, simply by calling 1-800-QUIT-NOW. There are also a variety of other language services available, such as the dedicated line for Spanish speakers at 1-877-2-NO-FUME. Um, for individuals who prefer to interact uh, but by a text, certainly they can text ready to 200, 400 through the new text to enroll program. So what services are all available through the quit line? First and foremost are the quit coach calls. Uh, typically it's about a 30, 40 minute call with a quit coach where they can help um, enhance the quit plan, work through questions and challenges that an individual might have about making a quit attempt, about better understanding their tobacco use, and, and further, again, enhance that quit plan with the individual. The quit coaches are great at providing individualized and tailored support based off of their needs. Individuals can also receive, uh, when they sign up for services, can also receive mail quit kit and print materials sent directly to their home 
for free, a variety of motivational tips and tricks, um, worksheets and activities to work through to just help write down some thoughts about motivations and uh, coping skills that they hope to, to utilize. Again, for individuals who prefer to interact virtually, there are options to uh, receive some web-based support through web coaches and chat online to the coaches, as well as chat online for, uh, with peers. For individuals who are between the ages of 18 and 24, they can participate in a text to quit program to receive some text message based support. So providing a little bit uh, different technological option for individuals who might prefer to text as opposed to picking up that phone. And one final option for 18 for callers who are 18 years or older, they are eligible to receive two weeks of free NRT in the form of patch gum or lozenge mailed directly to their home. Uh, at no cost to the individual and um, really great option to provide a little bit of a buffer if they're getting used to a medication or need a little bit of financial support uh, to get started. So great option. Um, you as clinicians can further the impact of the quit line by participating in the Facts to Quit program. Essentially, essentially, this is going to allow you to provide Facts referrals for individuals who mentioned they may be interested in utilizing the quit line with their patients. Certainly providing that phone number is an excellent option, uh, but if you're able to provide a referral, then that the quit line will actually reach out and call the patient proactively. So taking away just a little bit of that barrier, taking away the first step, um, instead of relying on the patient to make that first step, the quit line will reach out and call them directly, which ultimately improves access to treatment, increases uh, quit line satisfaction, increases access to the quit line, and long-term actually does increase 30-day abstinence rates. So if you are interested in the Facts to Quit program, please reach out to me. I'm happy to discuss uh, next steps and get you signed up for the program. So we talked about providing assistance for individuals who are ready to quit. Uh, let's shift over to individuals who might not be ready to quit at this point in time. Um, this is where we want to provide that motivational interventions, uh, motivational interviewing techniques. So really want to develop that intrinsic motivation, understand what are their reasons for continuing to use tobacco? What are the, the pros and cons uh, to using tobacco and the pros and cons of perhaps uh, quitting and sustaining recovery? This is where we can build self-efficacy, build confidence, uh, work through understanding the ambivalence and working to reduce ambivalence and, and working to build that change talk. Additionally, uh, if we focus entirely on making that full quit attempt, we might miss an opportunity to make perhaps an intermittent change and intermittent goal that can serve as a building block for a long-term quit, long-term abstinence. So this is the point where we can assess interest in reducing smoking and reducing use of certain tobacco products. Uh, there are many options to doing this, uh, so it's important to find what's going to work for the client. Perhaps they reduce the number of cigarettes one to two per day or per week. Um, perhaps they delay the time of first cigarette in the morning, um, wait an extra 15 minutes from when they typically use the first cigarette, or maybe they're ready to make a practice quit attempt, uh, just a few hours, a few days, or maybe a whole week. Um, certainly great practice for building and understanding symptoms of withdrawal and, and what they might experience through that process and, and practice utilizing those coping skills that you've worked with. So pulling it all together, uh, individuals who smoke do benefit from a combination of medication and behavioral therapies. Um, they may need more intensive treatment. They may face some unique challenges that need, needs more tailoring, um, but they are interested in quitting. They are ready to quit. They, they want to quit and they are able to quit. Uh, they may just need some, some more support from their providers. So, to learn more about this tailored support, um, please feel free to take a look at the Bucket Approach online training. The Bucket Approach training is a free skills-based and competency training program that provides, uh, expands on what we talked about today, uh, but provides insight into evidence-based tobacco treatment and how it can be tailored to support individuals who live with a, a mental health disorder or substance use disorder. To access the Bucket Approach training, you can check out helpusquit.org. Uh, it's divided into two courses, uh, looking at the basics of tobacco dependence treatment, all of our evidence-based practices, and then how can we further tailor it to everyone's individual needs. 
there is free CE available for uh, many different individuals and professions for taking the bucket approach training as well. Um, so just taking the course has been available for almost two years now. So just taking a look at some of our preliminary evaluation on the bucket approach. It was launched in October of 2019 and as of August 2021, there have been 999 enrollees in the training. Uh, we've now passed that 1000 mark, which is great to see. Um, but a lot of enrollment within an interest within the bucket approach training. Um, over 500 registrants have been from Wisconsin, but there's also been registrants from 41 different states throughout the U.S. and six different countries. So pretty, pretty wide reach, which is great to see. Um, as far as profession wise, uh, most people that complete the training have masters in social work, um, nursing degrees, BSN, RN, etc. But there have been many other degrees, PhDs, MDs, MPH, other master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, uh, many different people have completed the training. As far as where are these enrollees working, 64% uh, are working in behavioral health treatment uh, somewhere. 44% uh, work in treatment facilities that address mental health and substance use disorders. About 38% work in uh, mental health exclusive treatment centers and uh, about 8% work in substance use disorder treatment settings as well. So what has been the feedback on the evaluation? Uh, most students report having the skills needed to address tobacco use with clients. Over 60% report that at three month and six month follow up, 60% um, report that the course was very or extremely useful or effective. And as far as being able to implement all of the material that was learned in training, um, again, there was a three month and six month survey sent out to people who completed the bucket approach training. And we do see that at six month follow up, there was statistically significant uh, difference in being able to utilize all of the interventions that were discussed in the bucket approach training. Uh, so what this shows us is that uh, some people were able to utilize the skills and knowledge right away, which is a critical element. Um, and some people needed a little bit of additional support to be able to integrate that into a daily clinical practice. So if you are interested in the training or interested in some technical assistance to further be able to integrate what we've talked about today and the material in the content in the bucket approach training, uh, please feel free to reach out to myself um, or the other ROS throughout the state. Uh, we provide free training and technical assistance on all of these topics and are more than happy to have a discussion, provide additional training, uh, whatever your needs might be, or direct you to the appropriate person. Um, so again, I'm located in Green Bay. I'm, I'm nearby, but I do cover 25 counties throughout northeastern Wisconsin. Um, and if you are located in another region of the state, either reach out to me or your appropriate outreach specialist. Um, so with that, I will put up my contact information one more time and pass it back over to Mac for his final thoughts. Thank you, Sarah. That's right, you can't not have this. Well, thank you so much for that. So what I one of the things I got from that presentation, I've seen this, I've worked with these folks now for 12 years and that's where the optimism, part of the optimism comes from, is our tobacco programs have been very effective, creative. There's been a lot of money and effort invested into having the tobacco prevention control programs going while we get ready to do our part. And that's part of what we're up to today is to take another look at this. I think, here we go. I'm gonna cover very, in a short form, two elements as we get ready to do tobacco use disorder treatment in our addiction services in Wisconsin. You got a bit of a flavor of that from what Sarah was presenting, that there are a lot of resources available. So when we start getting into our part of this, we have this available. When Sheila White's created the program up in Marshfield, she will tell you that the materials, the educational materials they, she got for the, her staff development to be able to do this came from C-Tree. So though that resource, and they've been building since the when TIP was uh, brought into the, the C-Tree program as a major element to this. 
uh, that they re had continued to develop this. Now, when we started WinTip, when I first got involved with this, I would have mostly was focusing on the addiction side of this. That's what New York State had done. But our team, our steering committee team, which by the way is made up of representations, representatives from tobacco, the tobacco program, from the uh, mental health program in the division of care and service uh, treatment, the addiction side, which we had a representative there, and I'm the representative fit on addiction. And then the other two are the, rep the two gov agencies governing these issues, which is, in fact, uh, the Division of Public Health Tobacco Program and the Division of Safety and Treatment, Care and Treatment, uh, uh, Bureau of Prevention, Treatment and Recovery. So the steering committee that's created all of this decided we were not going to have an exclusive effort to direct this at, at addiction, substance use, but rather we were going to embrace the entire behavioral health spectrum. And so that's what we've been doing. So this work on the bucket approach and the rest of these, a lot of these have been because of the feedback and the input from, from folks from the uh, from the other side of behavioral health, namely the mental health psychiatric side that we've got here. Okay, how do we transition? There's a missing piece in this because what we're focusing on today for me is, this a, is the addiction part of it, the SUV part of it. How do we do this? Well, what WinTip is doing is it's been referenced to it uh, throughout uh, this presentation was we need to begin systems change analysis and make improvements. Well, what are those improvements? Well, we will determine what in each program uh, what those need to be as to how you're going to include tobacco use disorders in what you're already doing. How are you going to do that? It's one thing to have somebody mandate it. How are we going to do that? And provide the education, training, and technical assistance necessary to be able to do that. Because it's going to, we're, take, we're turning a tobacco tolerance system, which addiction treatment has been, not only the treatment, but the recovery community has been a tobacco tolerant cultural situation system since the beginning. So we're going to try and nudge it to become a tobacco free culture and standard of practice. We're going to need to move towards that. So today I'm using these two efforts, uh, issues around core competencies and some of the uh, common characteristics of addiction that I developed in some of my earlier work. Core competencies, well, what are they? How do we do what we do best? And then do the best we can until we know better than what you know better, do better. And that's kind of what this uh, transition into what we're talking about today. So let's take a look first of all on the core competencies and functions of a certified uh, CSAC uh, or SAC. Uh, what are the core competencies? What are we talking about here? Let's see. Here they are. And what I'd like us to think about is as I'm going through these, we're going through these, to think how hard will it be to bring tobacco related nicotine dependence issues into these different skills and core competencies that, that, that we get uh, trained in and which we have to demonstrate skills in in order to function as an addiction uh, substance use professional. Patient screening, our screening, the, the, the process of, okay, somebody comes to see us, what are we doing, what do, we can, what do they want, what do they need, do they belong in a, as a candidate for admission to a, a substance use treatment program. Intake, okay, we need to find out if they in fact do qualify in order to get into our programs. The, the intake process is to, to finding the suitability that this person's got. It. Now can you see where tobacco would be a problem different from a, for alcohol or other drugs versus the screening and intake process? I don't think so. No. I've done it. I was trained in these core competencies. There's no particular, just, it's just using, okay, this is a specific disorder we're including in our larger look at what kind of substances are involved. Orientation, okay, this is the kind of treatment program we have. Uh, here's what our expectations and requirements we're going to ask you to sign. 
uh, that you're in agreement and you uh, make a commitment to participate in our program as we're offering it. Same thing for tobacco, letting them know what Sheila said and their, when their pre-intake was, okay, this program is alcohol and it's uh, drug and tobacco free. And that means you can't smoke or drink or drug while you're in here, but we'll help you if you need detox or withdrawal management in order to be comfortable for getting the treatment, we'll offer that. Then the assessment, okay, outcomes the, the DSM-5 criteria for diagnosis and we explore with the person as to whether or not the extent of their disorder it is what they, they are going to benefit from our treatment and what level of care properly we're doing the assessment is going to be best most helpful for them as we do the assessment process and treatment planning if we're doing a program where we're treating alcohol and drugs together and now we're going to include tobacco we're going to apply the same sorts of, of of expectations around this whole process so there won't be any great difference once the, the patient has been your client has decided that while they're receiving treatment they're going to be tobacco and nicotine free or if they're on their withdrawal management and if there needs to be some kind of nicotine replacement because they're not able to handle the first few days or a week without going bananas and, and go jonesing off the nicotine then we take care of that and the counseling process all right, but what I do when I'm working with this, I'm looking for the connections. I'm looking for the relationship between their smoking and their drinking. How do these fit together? Or their cocaine, or their opiates, or anything else? What role has your smoking and use of tobacco been connected to what's been going on the way you use your drug of choice? So you're doing that in a situation where you're looking for, you're asking them for their help, is how do you do this? How do you figure this out, kid? And then usually if you're in a group, if you have the group situation, people will talk freely about this. You're not trying to punish them or anything. Well, what are the connections? We need you to help us find out what those are because this is new for most of us. Case management, the same kind of issues around tobacco and the crisis. And all of these are our core functions that tobacco fits into just like a glove. There's really nothing about any of these specific skills that would rule out tobacco and nicotine. So I'll move on from that because that's the core competencies for substance use. And once you get through those 12, then you can get this document from SAMHSA, 224 pages of core competencies. It expands the ongoing development of a counselor to being able to all kinds of uh, skills around all of those competencies to make them more efficient, effective, and get better outcomes. Then we've got the core competence for certified tobacco treatment specialists. Now, I was the first addictions counselor in Wisconsin that was trained in these. Uh, this is up the Mayo Clinic where I got my training up there and was, was certified up there. And so I'm a tobacco treatment specialist after my five days of intensive training at the Mayo Clinic, expanding on some of the work that uh, Sarah was talking about. So what are these core competencies? Well, here they are. You probably can't read them too easy, but this training covers uh, the 11 core competencies. Now, I know a bit about these because I'm on the team right now, the A2 team, that which is the Association for Treating Tobacco Use and Dependence. I'm on the NADAC, Mike Kemp was here this morning from NADAC. I'm on that committee that's revising these core competencies for tobacco treatment specialists. So I'm kind of in the middle of that right now. So tobacco tenants, knowledge and education, diversity and specific health issues. Now they're getting into issues you don't usually directly find in our 12 competencies, but this is what they determined when they were doing this training, that these are relevant and uh, assessment interviewing, treatment planning. That assessment interviewing, I was able to get them in the language, put the language, the DSM language and ASAM language. And when you're doing an assessment, that they're using a DSM uh, a form to be able to determine can they fit the diagnostic uh, profile of somebody having a tobacco use disorder. They didn't have that in the core competency before, they're going to have it in this one. Then the treatment planning, pharmacotherapy, uh, Sarah was talking about the specifics to that, 
counseling skills, relapse prevention, that word come in in their, in their core competencies. We've got it in, in our, our treatment planning and continuing care work. Uh, law and ethics, we don't have anything in those 12, but that means that according to that 224 pages of core competencies, these issues keep cropping up and they can, we can pay attention to them. Professional development and professional resources. So this is, this is kind of a real quick look at tobacco as opposed to, not opposed to, I want to get into this silo where we're going to get arguing, fighting about which is the best. We're trying to find where the bridges are so that we can do this better. And now NADAC has, got, has had all along, they've been an advocate for tobacco integration. And they've had this uh, nicotine dependent specialist certification available. And if you go on their website, you can look into that. So there's been a bit of this going on in the addiction side with our, our, our addiction specialist. Uh, but most of us didn't know anything about, I didn't until I got involved with this work. Now here are these, this, this graphic here. We don't want to, I don't want to get in a situation where they were not recognizing that the only established tobacco use disorder treatment is within the cessation model of the tobacco control model. We don't want to, we don't want to in any way disturb that good work. It's, it's part of the, the ways of approaching this. And we've got our addiction system. Think of what it can mean when, when this, we're able to do this in 3,500 people who are already trained as substance use counselors and providers who will be available to apply fit all of our skills and knowledge to the tobacco use disorder that we'll be now uh, asked to be start doing. And think of what that means. That means that people who were denied access to our services and if they are open now to that, think of what over a few years the lives will be saved. The quality of lives will be improved in the populations we deal with when they have this service, which is going to be something we already know how to do, is just incorporated to include this in. Common complications. We're going to switch a bit here to some of the work because people are uh, our counselor friends and colleagues. Okay, well, that's all very well. Good. This is unfamiliar to us. And besides, I'm not convinced that nicotine dependence is really an addiction after all, compared to opiate addiction. This is something different altogether. Uh, I'm not comfortable with treating this as an, as an, on an equal basis. Uh, I'm not sure I want to apply the same level of commitment to helping these people as I am to helping people who are more deserving, like people who are going to overdose and die from uh, too much and too many narcotics. Okay. So part of this is, I, is when I first, and I knew when I started offering this, that there had to be some way to convince people of the similarity, the commonality of these. So I'll just take a few minutes to go through it. We're more alike than we are different. That's what those people told, 15 people told us, we're not like you addicts. Okay, well, let's find out a bit about that. Okay, some of the, before we get into some of the model I used, the McMaster model, uh, let's take a look at the social norms, common characteristics uh, of all of these uh, uh, drugs that we are involved with. The heredity factor, the three alcoholic generations in my family. My father was an alcoholic who had 20 years of sobriety before his other addiction killed him. Well, what was his other addiction that gave him that lung cancer that killed him so miserably? It was his untreated tobacco use, his, his three pack a day smoking. They killed him. Okay, but he was in, I've got a son in 20 years of, of drug treatment, drug recovery. This runs in our family. It's normal norms. Most of us started using as adolescents with other with our friends and other people, maybe family members. So there's a, a, a there's a background of us using these substances to have a good time, uh, to get out there and get wild or whatever else. There's other language I'm not allowed to use here of what our desire was to get feeling good and feeling better. Okay, so I wrote the, the, the model, the, the manual. I forgot to bring one. It's a three ring binder that we produced when we were paying people, counselors to come to our training. We wanted to pay them $999 to come and get trained. Did any of that, did you guys eat your 95, 99 yet? Well, you probably aren't going to, but we did. That was part of that contingency planning. 
People didn't, maybe they didn't want to do this. They didn't see how it fit. They had heard this information that I'm sharing, we're sharing today. They had never heard it. They had not been exposed to it. So we did this manual. And in that, I, did, I created the McMaster model. That's pretty grandiose, but I'll just use it for this, uh, this uh, today. So what is this? What a common characteristic. Let's take a look and see if there are any. Yeah, I want to remember we are over time already. Are we? Are we yeah. still in it? Yeah, 3.45 is when we ended. Oh, it did? Closing time. Oh, that means the case I'll have to wrap this up before I give you the McMaster model. You'll have to get the, get it and invite me to come somewhere. We hadn't done this together in this three parts, so that I'm sorry if we've gone over the time. Well, we got a couple minutes. I just want to make sure. Well, I'll take a couple of minutes then just to let you know what this basically is. This is based on the commonality of the different way these different drugs affect the brain and produce social benefits. And they produce them and they all produce additional benefits from doing them. And there are harmful consequences on the one side are health consequences, on the other side are life consequences. And then there's a treatment option and recovery or the, the pathological outcome from using these drugs. And every one of them, if you check, if you use this model, you can see where it is. And what we did was with, with nicotine, we had a, a balance to see which one was the life consequences or the health consequences. When we did that, the majority said it was the health consequences. That was what the issue was. That was the thing that was going to be able to drive recovery was we need to do something to, to fix that, and make that better. And when we did alcohol, they came down equivalent. The life consequences and the damage from drinking and drugging, drinking alcohol, and the health consequences were both equal, and we did the different with, uh, with marijuana, with cannabis and the rest. So this model can be applied, but I'm not gonna be able to do it today because I talk too fast. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk fast enough, that's what it was. So including conclusion to this, then, one final comment is, we're on the verge of being able to do something we haven't been able to do. Now, I'm 86 years old. I've been doing this recovery since 1956. 86, 65 years I've been doing personal recovery. I've been doing 47 years as an addiction specialist. Got a certain amount of credibility from that. And we're on the plate and the bridge now with this D875 rule coming in that for the first time, we're gonna be able to expand our services to do what we weren't able to do, we didn't understand we needed to do for a long time. And so what you do, and it, and our colleagues in this field is to support this. Be, do the best you can with whoever you can to influence whoever you can. And if we finish my finish my my last swan song is I am going to challenge the state of Wisconsin to direct the funds and the resources that have been held back because we weren't willing to do it. And I'm going to put some pressure on them to be willing to do it for the sake of the of the people who are here to treat and save. It's time now to get off the sideline and do what's ethically the right thing to do. So thank you very much uh, for coming to our session today. Uh, please hang in here with us as we did this for the first time. Maybe somebody else will want us to do it again. If we do, I'll probably shorten some of this up. But when you got, when I got clean and sober, I was told by my sponsor, look, you're now in recovery. Therefore, you have a voice. Your voice and your story is legitimate. You may have opinions, you may have whatever else you have. But if you have a voice and people don't know something, it's important you try and tell them the best you can, as convincingly as you can, as respectfully as you can, until you haven't got any more breath left to say. So you can shut this off then now, and we're done. I'll hang around.